Sylvia. I am the CEO for the Kent Chamber. And so on behalf of myself and the board, we'd like to welcome you to our November luncheon. Um, I'm really excited because, again, a new luncheon, a new month, and new people. So that makes me very happy. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, today we have the pleasure of hearing from City of Kent Economic Development Manager Bill Ellis. And he's just going to give us an update and then also take some time to answer questions. Uh, like always, this luncheon typically is streamlined, but it's going to be videotaped, which means we will then have this video recording available on um, I Love Kent. And we appreciate I Love Kent because they come out and they record and or live stream these luncheons so that you can share it with your uh, colleagues and then you can also refer back if there's information that you need. Um, so with that being said, we're going to go ahead and we will talk to Bill. All right, Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm Bill Ellis. I'm going to figure out the moment or where to strap this device to. Um, but there we go. Um, so, Zenobi has asked me here today. I'm, I'm the Chief Economic Development Officer for City of Kent uh, to just give a little information on uh, what the Economic Development Division is working on and some facts about the city. Um, first thing I thought I'd, I'd just do is. Uh, Reveal for the first time in a public setting uh, our Kent Valley WA is in Washington website. Uh, so KentValleyWA.com. Uh, for the longest time uh, that I've been in Kent, uh, I've always noticed that on a public policy side and, and in the various business communities, we often talk about Auburn and Tukwila and Des Moines and Durian and Renton very separately. And um, the reality is uh, a lot of the businesses interact with one another up and down the valley. And that's been recognized in the private sector in the real estate community for a very long time. In fact, uh, when you read all the publications walk, looking at retail submarkets in the Seattle area, Kent Valley is one of the most well-known. It has about a third of the industrial property in Puget Sound is in that area from South Seattle, I'm, I'm sorry, from Boeing Access Road in South Seattle, basically Tukwila, down to Sumner. And then the roads go, east-west instead of north-south into the port of Tacoma, and so does the river, and so does the type of soil and the cost of construction of new industrial buildings. So this 125 million square feet, no one was really on the public sector side or in the economic development circle side uh, talking about this is one sort of economic unit with a very clear, similar profile of concentration and logistics and in manufacturing. So we set out, Michelle and I, to, uh, Michelle Wilmot here, uh, Economic Development Manager uh, at the City of Kent, we're the team of two that's, that takes up the Economic Development Division at the, at the City of Kent, um, to talk to our counterparts in the other cities and say, hey, you know, when we're meeting with a company from another part of the country or another part of the world, and they say, you know, we want to set up shop in, in near Boeing because we're serving them, or we want to be somewhere in the Seattle area, they go, they're usually being shepherded around with a broker, and they say, I don't particularly care if I'm on this side of the river in Tuckwiller or in that side in Kent. I don't particularly care if I'm here in Renton or Auburn. Rent's all about the same. Everything else is about the same. I just need something that fits in this footprint. And, and all of that's kind of close to Boeing, because Boeing's in all of these cities. Just like, you know, for instance, Starbucks has its roasting plant here. It roasts 55 million coffee beans a year. And all of that gets into trucks and goes to Auburn before it distributes somewhere else. It, we're all very connected. And uh, it's from that observation, and you know, we're all economic development folks at the city side trying to just get that business into our area because we know that has having that business in the area supports all the other businesses. Um, that we wanted in a non-competitive fashion, what I call collaboration, <laughs> try to out collaborate against other regions, whether that's Snohomish County or other competitive regions around Puget Sound. Start telling the story of what we are because together we're much bigger uh, than we are uh, independently. I'm just gonna walk away from the screen from the video, just to scroll down a little bit. Just to give you a sense of the scale when you actually total up what's in the submarket of the industrial, uh, Kent Industrial Valley. $7 billion in direct uh, business revenue, 252,000 employees, it's more than Spokane, 100,000, uh, sorry, 10,000 businesses. Um, and when you look at, you drill down on some of this, about one in five jobs in the Kent Valley are held in manufacturing. So there's 49,000 jobs there. And then 22,000 of those jobs are in the aerospace sector. We actually have half of all the new space jobs. We have a little bit of a space race going on in our backyard. 
Uh, Boeing announced yesterday their, their submission to NASA for the Artemis program for the uh, lunar lander. Uh, Blue Origin submitted a rival with Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman, uh, their lunar lander. Um, Blue Origin, by the way, is growing to 4,000 employees, or over 2,100 now, and it's the largest employer in the city of Kent. Uh, you can drive by in 72nd right now and see their new 240,000 square foot uh, research and development facility and headquarters, which is two blocks away from the Boeing Space Center, which also retains a couple thousand employees. It's not just them, it's the supply chain to that space industry. So we have a lot of things to talk about, but it's better when we talk about them together. Uh, Leo Stella is a company that makes uh, manu manufactured satellites. Uh, there's going to be a lot of business in the near future, as rockets start to be reusable, and can land and take off over and over again, for making more and more satellites that become more economical to put more of them in the area. That's why space flight industries and their brand, uh, Leo Stella Satellites, chose to be in Tukwila. What we get to do now is say, that's part of the Kent Valley cluster. <laughs> and we can brag on that to a to region, to the state, to other states, and to the nation by talking collectively about that. Um, I also want to just share with you, I urge you all to take a look at this, look at the business directory, look at the value proposition, some of the real estate tools that we have on this website. We're still working to fine tune some things and we're working on a strategy for getting search engine optimization up and doing some rollout. But uh, I wanted to share with the local chamber first where we are in this effort. Um, just want to share some statistics as well on the health of the Kent marketplace. I've, I've sometimes seen people say things like, well, I see a lot of signs that are say, you know, space available, vacant, lease. But I think uh, it's worth checking some of the actual uh, data to see what, what the facts are in terms of what way we're going in both employment and uh, 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 real estate. So right now, just the city of Kent's portion of this industrial market, which is about 40% of the Kent Valley, by the way, uh, it's about 3.5%. What does that mean? 5% is really constrained. 3.5% means speculative development for new warehousing, off the charts, <laughs> profitable, right? So uh, we have had a lot of that over the last few years. Industrial land is now over $40 a square foot. Uh, within the subcategory of space suitable for manufacturing, there's a 2.3% vacancy rate. So we actually have a, a really hard time finding places for small and medium-sized manufacturers who want to relocate into this area. Uh, recently, I met with the CEO of Manini's, which is a gluten-free pasta maker. They have about 27 employees up in the valley. And I asked that business, what is the greatest challenge you, said, you see uh, for Kent? And what are the, what's one of the hardest ways, or what is the one thing the city can do to help bring in more companies like yourself? Growing really fast, and 1,300 different retail, uh, retail outlets across the country. And he said, actually, one of the hardest challenges I have is just finding the location I'm in. Just trying to find space between eight 20,000 square feet, incredibly hard, because property owners and developers are very much focused on trying to chase the e-commerce business or the very large distribution center that serves all the population growth in this area and all that last in, last mile, uh, very fast delivery to the customer that people now expect with Amazon delivery. He said, actually, there's a lot of other firms that I know that would want to come out of South Seattle and elsewhere and come down to Kent if there was more actual real estate available in that category. Um, and he, he gave an example of someone who did find their way in here, and I'm trying to reach out to them, and hopefully they'll become a Kent Chamber member someday. Uh, Salumi, I don't know if you know that uh, little famous restaurant in Pioneer Square. The restaurant's still there. Production space is coming to Kent. They never thought they were going to be in Kent. They thought they were going to be in South Seattle. It's been, too, <laughs> it's been a crazy five or six years in the industrial submarket, and uh, that's why the rents in Kent uh, are up a lot. Uh, so, other other numbers to share with you. Uh, office office category uh, eight point seven percent vacancy. Not as not as healthy as industrial. In fact, it's uh, the rents are still pretty low, but they have now surpassed finally their pre recession levels, and we've started to see some uh, outside investment buying some big office complexes in Kent, like the Creekside and Center Point, recently transacted for forty million dollars. That's because I think office is is has reached a new level, and, and what. Uh, this one investor said, uh, you know, he's seen a lot of his businesses up in Bellevue start to say, well, my employees are commuting from Kent. That's a little too far for them. I'm thinking it's a good bet to go back into the office space in Kent Valley because branch offices are going to start making sense for these businesses. They can't have afford to pay their employees the wages necessary to live up in Bellevue. 
So that's starting to happen. Um, so office rents are now at all time high since the recession of 2009, um, up to over $16.59 triple net. Compare that to Bellevue or Seattle, or it's over 30. It's, it's not as healthy, it's not as in demand. But our vacancy is not that bad at 8.7%. Uh, for, for comparison, Seattle, 7.5% vacancy in office. Federal way, it's over 30%. So Kent's doing pretty well as compared to some of its peers here in South King County. And uh, not, not as well as Seattle and Bellevue, that's true, but we are being something of a rock star in the industrial category right now. Um, so just a few other statistics I wanted to share with uh, this group. Um, you may not know that uh, an estimated 6.5% of all car view, cargo by value of trade entering or exit a port of Seattle, port of Tacoma, or the airport passes through, not, I'm sorry, not doesn't pass through, it originates or ends in the city of Kent. Pass through is a larger number. There's about 1,500 trucks every single day that originate from just the city of Kent's warehouses. Um, just keep in mind that per truck, that's you know maybe 15 times the weight of a passenger car. So the city of Kent's having to do a lot to, to, to think through some strategies right now about how we can optimize our, our, our revenue and think about how we can continue to sustain a very large logistics industry that is very important to the region and to the city of Kent. In the Kent Valley, we have about 42,000 workers in global trade and supply chain management. And that's a key competitive factor for all the other industries that are here. So it's really important that we start to work on some strategies. And you might have heard a little bit about Rally the Valley. So that's a lot of what that's about, is trying the city, trying to talk to the development community, talk to business owners, and try to come up with, not, there's no one solution to that problem, but come up with a range of recommendations to start thinking through how can the city become more fiscally sustainable and more competitive uh, in recruitment of companies into that area. So some other statistics. Uh, this, this global trade and supply chain management cluster uh, brings in about $14 billion in business revenue. Uh, that's indirect, not just directly observed. Um, and I would also say that over the last uh, 10 years, our regional share of manufacturing growth has risen to 27%. That's a pretty big achievement knowing that there's been a steep decline in Seattle and other places in the manufacturing sector. The city of Kent's grown quite a bit, and Kent Valley has quite grown quite a bit in manufacturing, not just because we have growth stories like Exotic Metals Forming Company or Blue Origin adding thousands of employees over the last couple of years, but because we're actually a very competitive location for manufacturers, a lower cost location than some of the places that they're moving out from and into. So uh, that's been a part of the story as well. So our share of the overall manufacturing has grown. Our percentage of employment in manufacturing in Kent Valley and in the city of Kent is up over the last few years. And uh, with that, I just wanted to open myself up to some questions on health of the market, some of the things the city might be working on, things I mentioned just now. Yeah. What have you seen as far as the growth of small business? You know, I have a big stack of papers here, and I haven't looked at that one just as much. But I would say, um, obviously, the lion's share of the 10,000 businesses are in small and medium-sized category. Right, uh, I don't. I, I can't recite off my head percentage growth in, in small and medium sized business, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like the Kent Valley has been very successful in attracting manufacturing businesses. Are you, uh, or is Kent going to continue to incentivize manufacturing businesses to come, or is that a um, a sector that you feel you've saturated and you want to focus on? Maybe so you mentioned the office space. Being sure. Uh, more available? I, we would like to actually start incentivizing manufacturing. We've had success in it without incentive. Uh, Washington State is a state that, unlike a lot of our competing states in manufacturing, uh, has very strict uh, rules about public gift of funds that are interpreted in such a way that economic development isn't seen. It's quite the public benefit that could give the incentives. So we lost the manufacturing from flow. It's now shape technologies. It's been here in Kent for almost 50, 60 years. We lost 150 employees uh, to Kansas where they gave millions of dollars to that company for worker retraining. We have no competing incentive from the city of Kent let, or the state to play even in the same sandbox in terms of uh, tax incentives that other states have. Um, so we compete on talent and 
talent alone. So when Flow moved those 150 jobs here, they also retained their corporate headquarters of Shape Technologies in Kent. Double down on that, expanding that, that's 350 workers. So the very high value, high end engineering, research and development, corporate sales, all the executive jobs are staying in Kent, birthed from the manufacturing. But that moved out of the area. And some of the reasons that the CEO who met with them, uh, Mr. Savage, gave for that was that Blue Origin took all their best machinists, Amazon took all their warehouse picker jobs, and they weren't competing on wages so well. Then the landlord increased by about a million dollars the rent because they're now competing with e-commerce. They looked at all that and suddenly the competition for manufacturing being here versus Kansas, where they own the land, they said, well, the workers aren't nearly as good in Kansas as they are in Washington, but the state of Kansas put millions of dollars into the pot. Can't compete with that. How do we become really competitive, though, for that high-tech location to do very well here, the part that we retain? And that's also part of the Rally the Valley project that the city's working is how do we up the level of amenity? How do we make that young, uh, you know, people always think of tech worker as a, someone who maybe gets a BA degree here and goes works at Amazon at South Lake Union. We need to start thinking about the tech worker who is uh, gonna go work on making the next generation of uh, water jet machines that shape technologies. They may come from anywhere. They may wanna move and live in Kent. What are they gonna feel about the work environment every day? How are they gonna feel about the transit? How are they gonna feel about park space? How are they gonna feel about their lunch options? Uh, you know, it's maybe 20 minutes in the middle of the day to get from here at Kent Station up to the Shape Technologies. You know, those are the types of things that we also need to be looking at from a policy, land use policy perspective, as well as a transportation perspective. Other things that we can do to sort of lower the cost or make change of use to accommodate more manufacturers in the area are what we're also talking about. How do we make it less onerous from a tenant improvement standpoint for a manufacturer to move into an older building in, in Kent. Um, so that's not direct incentive, it's traditionally understood in economic development, but something that we are working on and, and, and are gonna have results by April 1 to show. Uh, as far as uh, uh, marketing manufacturing, we very much wanna market, uh, Michelle and I are very much clued into the different trade organizations in this region to say that we're a great location here in the Valley for more manufacturing. Um, only about 9% of that 125 million square feet in industrial space. Actually, I'm sorry, for city of Kent, there's 45 million square feet of industrial space. 86% of it's in storage, warehouse use. 9% is in manufacturing. It would be a great goal for the city to get from 9% manufacturing to like 15%. A heady goal. <laughs> One that's gonna be challenging because there is a lot of headwind for even more storage and distribution used to be here. We're a very great location for that too. So manufacturers are having to compete for real estate with that other use. And a manufacturer's footprint starts to become, on average, for instance, City Kent, uh, number of manufacturers that are greater than 50,000 square feet, very, very few. Uh, most manufacturers are under 50,000 square feet. So their competition in the real estate market for scarce leased space when it's really low vacancy, like it has been for the last five or six years, very, very hard. So uh, we're looking at ways that we can encourage the development community to produce more space aimed for that manufacturer. Yeah. So um, do you have any statistics on the workers that actually live in Kent that work in Kent versus yes. who commutes to Kent for work? Yeah, actually I do. Um, I can read some of that to you now. About 14% of the city of Kent, 14% um, of the jobs in the city of Kent are held by Kent residents. Um, Actually, the vast majority of people who work in the Industrial Valley, which has the lion's share of our jobs, uh, are coming from unincorporated King County. So 14% uh, are from Kent, 25% uh, are from unincorporated King County, 8% uh, eight, eight are from Seattle, 6% from Auburn, 6% from Tacoma, 6% from Thunder Way, 5% from Renton, 2% from Des Moines, 2% from Durian, and 2% from Bellevue. Um, little known fact about the Kent Valley, there's as many workers with advanced degrees, bachelor's or more advanced degrees, than exist in the city of Bellevue. We have a lot of high tech work here. That's usually overshadowed by the fact that we also, at the same time, have a large percentage of our workforce, over a quarter of them, with only a high school diploma or less. So we have a very bifurcated, when it comes to educational standing workforce, where we have very, very high tech workers in the Industrial Valley, and very, very low skill workers. We have not as much in the middle, but very high peaks in those two categories, especially compared to all the other employment districts in the Puget Sound area. So that's kind of an interesting challenge when we're trying to create 
um, an environment that's appealing to all categories of business. And that's what we do want to do and, and have balance for that. And that's some of the things that we're thinking about. Yeah. Um, I know there's been uh, quite a few luxury apartments built in the Kent area. Mm -hmm. But what about the livability for all of these employees you want to attract? So um, what's interesting, this apartment building here and some of the ones that are getting built on Meeker, what we've heard from the property owners is that they've actually rented whole floors and whole rooms to some of the big large companies that we have here because they can't get enough housing quickly enough for the thousands of workers that they're relocating into Kent. So um, I think that does speak to why uh, the city, you know, on the Meet Me on Meeker project, especially trying to concentrate residences along an area where there is the infrastructure to support them, where the future bus rapid transit line is supposed to go, closer to Sounder Station, closer into the amenities of shopping. So on the historic Main Street, seems like a good place to concentrate more people that are moving into the area and trying to see that we have more housing for them. I'm sorry, I missed you earlier. Uh, yes, I was just listening to your previous comments and it sounded like you were referring to the Land Management Act of 1964 that tends to restrict development along certain lines? Uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, well, is that what you were referring to? No, I wasn't, so I, I, I'm not actually familiar with that act, so. Uh, well, it's the legislation that establishes this area as a warehouse, or limits mm -hmm. the development of this area in relationship to Seattle. Uh, there's the urban growth line, and again, I'm not the land, I'm, I should not again. For the first time, I'm not the land use planner, so I'm not as familiar with some of the land use aspects of it. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a lot of local control over zoning for the city of Kent and, and controlling what kinds of uses are allowed where. One of the things that we're talking about with Rally the Valley is collapsing the category of uses and modernizing it. Because um, right now our zoning code, for instance, manufacturing distinguishes between manufacturing uses that are ferrous and those that are not. And this doesn't make any sense anymore. You know, drop forges, and they don't make no reference to 3D manufacturing or other things like that. So, trying to collapse the use categories and say, whatever you make, with as long as it's within the walls and meets certain performance standards, or standards of uh, noise or smell or danger, life and safety stuff, we don't need to go through this. Like, we have these huge books from like printed in the 70s that just land use planners got to go. Okay, you have ferrous material, mm, P, and then you know it's. it's it's outlandishly, laughably old-fashioned in that regard. So we want to collapse the use and make broader uses available in the industrial area. It's more in the development standard side when we're talking about um, scale of buildings. Can the building is a building trying to target tenants and manufacturing, or is it you know ten or twenty small manufacturers, uh, or is it trying to go after that big whale, you know that large toilet paper distribution center that's got a big multinational footprint? You know, we have 40, I mean, nothing wrong with that. We have 46 million square feet of that. And those are great companies and they do contribute well. It's, it's also just trying to, knowing that we have an opportunity to get even more manufacturing, uh, encouraging, incentivizing developers to build a little bit more space for those because we know on balance that produces more revenue and jobs for the city. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Of the employees that are coming to this area and all the industries that are looking for employees, is there any particular skills that are seem to be needed and wanted? Manufacturing engineers. Avionics. We just met with the new dean uh, yesterday <laughs> here in this building to talk about that. A similar question was asked. Um, I mean, there's there's. <clears throat> There's a lot of well-known positions in, 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 in the manufacturing field that are going unfilled. There's a lot of contract work that is not being taken because they employ, employers don't even bother posting the jobs anymore or taking the work, knowing that they won't get the skilled employee. It's not worth the effort. That's what we hear all the time. I've been hearing it for years, and it's a real difficult challenge. And uh, the city of Kent directly invested $100,000 last year to get off the ground, uh, AJAC Training Center at 212. We use that, when I say invested $100,000, $65,000 of that came from the Port of Seattle. Uh, we were in partnership with them um, to get a uh, aerospace joint apprenticeship committee uh, have their own facility. They're subletting some space from Airways Brewing Company. And uh, you know we'd like to see more be done in the K-12 system, especially to get 
Uh, you really have to start reaching kids at third or fifth grade if you want them to be ready for a job 15 years later in manufacturing. And uh, we've noticed that all our neighboring school districts have Core Plus programs and you know, Renton and Puyallup have a lot of students entering a, a youth apprenticeship now. Now, it's not to the scale of the uh, need that our manufacturers tell us. There's maybe only a couple dozen from those school districts. But symbolically, it's very important that you know, the kids be ready for the youth apprenticeship programs that exist to get them locked into Kent employers. So we notice right now, for instance, Ajax uh, placing dozens of students from the Renton School District at Kent employers because perennially, Kent School District underinvested in the types of skills that would have gotten them ready for that training center nearby. So, yeah. Um, I can just echo that. I personally just hired three Ajax uh, uh, interns from the Renton School District. It's working well if you can um, help get Kent schools more involved. I would say that it's they've got a good program going right now. We've been talking to them about that, and that's why we, you know, we invested in having the apprenticeship signing day for the entire state for youth apprenticeship at the Excesso Shower Center. We helped subsidize that event coming here with lodging tax dollars, not just because of the value that we thought it brought the hoteliers in having those room name, room nights. We also thought it had value and showing to the local community. Uh, the, you know, it was a great event to see the families and the students up there with the employers signing. They played the NBA sort of draft day music. Uh, it was kind of an emotional event for a lot of people. And it was also the spotlight, the fact that all these other school districts <laughs> are doing that and, and, and the value that that had for the employers and for the families of those school kids. So um, we're doing that quite deliberately and we're doing that to uh, help draw attention to the issue and try to encourage more of it. We're not direct educators, but we, we want to invest in the employer direction. So you talked to us a little bit about where we've been and where we are. You want to talk to us about where we're going and talk to maybe give us sure. some, if you have any forecasts that you guys are looking at? Well, uh, crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I read Bloomberg and CNBC and The so, Economist like everyone else. And, and you know, all those are always wrong. And they're the first thing you read them, the first to tell you they're wrong. So I'm not big into predictions, but I will say where we are going is, you you know, you look at the trend. Where have we always been? Going back to the Boeing Space Center in the late 60s, we've always been a high-tech R&D center for spacecraft, for aerospace, building materials, building machines to shape the materials for the, for the future. We've always had that as kind of one track, and that continues. That continues to be on a very upward trajectory with the Blue Origin facility going to 4,000 employees is really significant. It's like making up for and then some what we lost in the Boeing Space Center layoffs over the last 20 years. So that's super positive. Um, the logistics hub is the other story that came after the Boeing Space Center is all the logistics warehousing. And that's been doing very, very well. The thing I guess, I, I don't have a prediction as to where we're going exactly other than to say where I'd like us to go. <laughs> and I think where we, I'd like us to go is uh, as much as possible to lean into uh, the higher value activities, regardless of sector, regardless of industry. I, you know, I love this quote that uh, um, there's no such thing as a high tech or low tech industry, there's only high tech or low tech firms. I think about that not just in technology terms, I think about that in terms of quality. How do we always become the most competitive place for high value activities? Because one thing is for certain, in King County, it's always gonna get more expensive. And we're not gonna compete by being the lowest cost on a national or state level. That's, that's, that's inherent in the story I just said about flow. We're not gonna be the low cost area. We're too close to Seattle. There's a lot of other reasons that have nothing to do with local control about costs going up. What we can try to do is try to be the most competitive place for uh, firms and others that pay the highest wages, do things the best, do things the quickest, the most efficiently, the most productively, that innovate the most, that uh, have the highest value. So, um, try to steer towards that because I think that's how we remain a resilient business place. And I know, uh, you know, other places that try to swim against those tides sometimes they, they don't, they don't make it. <laughs> so, but I think we're making it right now. I think, I think I've always, I've always thought Kent was kind of on the edge, and I think we're tilting. Uh, if you look at um, income growth in the city of Kent, it's all in category household growth is all in the categories hundred thousand and above. That's kind of where we're headed. There's other things to be talked about there in terms of equity and other issues, which I'm not going to address. But 
I will say the way things are going right now is that Kent is adhering more closely to the higher value, high tech, uh, higher wage profile jobs and uh, commuters than, than not. Because I know the storyline in recent years had been kind of around the Brookings study done around the Great Recession, suburbanization of poverty, et cetera. That seems to be the last 10 years. That hasn't, that isn't what the next five years is projected to be right now, just factually. Yeah. Speaking to my question earlier about housing, yeah. I worked in the school district and quite a few of the children in the school district, their parents are low income workers. They're pickers at Amazon. They're employees of the fast food place. What about housing for the low income person? City is uh, starting a housing plan. We were applying for grant money to, to kick off a housing plan for the new year. So um, that is an issue. I'm, 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 my observation earlier about the higher wages kind of started to predominate in the sort of spread of, of where Kent is uh, percentage wise isn't to ignore or neglect the fact that there isn't a large part of the city of Kent in the lower income brackets. But um, uh, traditionally speaking, or traditionally, Traditionally is the wrong word. <laughs> Historically speaking, and, and I think even for the time being, City of Kent uh, is about 80% of AMI when it comes to housing, which means that 80% uh, our housing stock, our market price for housing stock is 80% of the area median income, which is usually when subsidies kick in. That's just the nature of the value of Kent. We're more affordable than the rest of the region. We've always been the flight to affordability location. <laughs> That might change as these higher incomes come in. It hasn't happened yet. It may in the future. Um, and we're going to do a plan to study what that is. Because that's there is some local policy involved in that, policy decisions that our local electeds will have to make. Our role will be just providing uh, facts <laughs> and explaining what programs, uh, what tools the state gives us and doesn't give us to address that or not. I have, I have a question for you. Yeah. For the, the people, you know, you hear about these um, 20 somethings that have a lot of student loan debt, you know, et cetera, and no job, and, you know, how are we going to repay, and uh, trying to put it on the taxpayer for the third one repayment. So, do we have anything that um, from a transition training that uh, could meet those needs? Uh, the manufacturing positions? Uh, worker retraining. Or those or educated kids? Worker retraining. Um, as a city directly, uh, no, we don't offer direct services. I did mention that I we, we invest in programs like AJAC or have, I mean, when we had an opportunity to do so with court funding. Um, I think it's a great question. It's kind of the answer is kind of, I'm sorry to make it, uh, I'm going to have to give a vague answer, kind of a broad one, which is, Yes, but um, the, I would say in a regional work, uh, workforce conversations that I've been a party to over time, when it comes to scarce resources, they tend to want to put it towards the young person instead of the incumbent worker, which we can, which is a debatable merit to that. The unemployed or people that, you know. Yeah, I think, I think it, well, it's partly another concept, another way to answer your question maybe, but is that Colleges are very much focused. They're like they're a little bit like a business in that they they try to go. They don't fund the, the training or the program based upon uh, the observed need in the economy. They base it upon where the tuition dollar takes them, and the tuition dollar could take them places that are pretty far afield from the local economy. Sometimes, literally, I know Highline College is very invested in a sustainable ag program. <laughs> Right, and that's not necessarily the local economy. It's not a lot of ag. I mean, all part of the side to Carpinito and the pumpkin patch that still exist. We've lost most of the okay, farm. I'm a farmer's daughter. <laughs> I, I, I grew up in the Kim Valley on the north end. Yeah. They're poor, you know, so I have a heart for the ag people. <laughs> Sorry. I don't mean it to be. I didn't mean to be flippant. I, I, I try not to come up flippant about that. No, but no, but, but, but like the large majority of the jobs now are. Not so. I mean, I, I think when it comes to the training, uh, uh, I think matching that, you know, you're, there's a missing element there. That, mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of people that can be retrained. 
country. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's called, yes, yeah, you know, those in that sort of world uh, call it incumbent job retraining, right? And, and it's just much, there's far fewer funding sources for it. And with unemployment below 4% for years and years and years, the colleges are always kind of cutting and tightening their belt. And their desire to go after existing workers who are maybe lower skilled versus trying to pursue the new tuition younger dollar, I mean, it's incentivized for them by that policy decision, which isn't necessarily the, those policymakers. It's going back to the advocacy role of chambers and others to talk to your elected officials about does the training dollar follow the student and whatever or the incumbent worker, or is it just made available ad hoc to whoever wants to enroll in culinary arts or this or that? Yeah, thanks. Any other question? Looks like Zenobia is going to give me the hook. So, oh, you're not? Oh, well, I thought you were. <laughs> Eventually. Uh, unless there's other questions. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity.